Oh my god, I think it's actually working. I think it's actually working. Yay! We, yay! we are trying something new. People may actually see the difference here. We're trying Zoom out for a change because we were having some issues with vMix and we decided to try a different format. So we are doing a Hangout today using Zoom and obviously OBS. So I'm going to have to wait here like five seconds to make sure we're actually streaming here because I have indications that we are and I have indications we aren't. So if you're in the live chat right now and you can hear us, um, say hi. So we know that uh, we're broadcasting. Or I can just sit and wait because I don't think it is. No, no joy. Well, this is odd. Let's see what we got wrong here. Oh, we are live. No, we are. No, it says we're live. It says we're live. So I got it here live. Let me refresh this real quick. Nobody wants to talk in the live chat to say that we're live. Yeah, world. Let yeah. us know that we're let it, that you hear us. Yeah, I don't want to do this whole presentation over again. Oh, I can see it. Look at this. See, this this is technology at work here. See, it's like Inception. You can't see it, but everybody else can see it. So, yeah, thank you, Frank, for streaming. Yeah, I, it, by the way, it pops up and everybody can read that. So, yes. Uh, anyways, <laughs> welcome to um, the Math Citadel's version of Welcome to GF4, which is, ga I'm going to get this right, ga Gallus Theory. Close enough? Yep. Gallus yeah, theory, well, yes. I, you know, I know there's a French way to say that, but I just say Gallus theory. But I feel like if I try the French accent do too it, hard, do then it. people, no, no, no. See, I oh, sound once. stupid. Oh. Nah. Well, anyways, we have Dr. Rachel Trailer with us. If you guys remember, she was with us on the uh, non sequitur show. Um, what were you talking about? I forget. Definitions. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitions. Uh, yeah, see, that's almost I paid attention to that one. No, I'm well, kidding. You have, I was going to say, you have so many dumpster fires, you can't remember the good ones. This is true. And you know what? Um, I happen to like the more, I don't know, ed educational ones. I don't get me wrong. I love the good dumpster fire. I'd be an idiot to say that I don't love the dumpster fires. But you know what? They only get you so far, right? I mean, I don't come out of a dumpster fire and going, God, I, I feel uh, a little smarter than I went in. Uh, but when I have a hangout like we did with the definitions of, of why things are important, uh, to define things properly and be rigorous, um, you know, you learn something. But anyways, welcome to my channel for a change. Hi. Hello. <laughs> she, she's so enthused. I love this. Um, but anyway, so the reason for this Hangout, um, we were talking, oh my goodness, we've been talking on Twitter for quite a while now, and uh, Dr. Trailer had a, pre well, a blog, I guess, on this particular topic, and, y y you know, it was simple, yet... It involved some advanced maths, and it was kind of like a merger between basic arithmetic and, well, advanced mathematics, really. Um, and for a lot of people, this might be review as far as if they've had matrix before, if they've had linear equations, solving yeah. sets of linear equations. And oh, for a lot of people, this might oh, be review I, is as that me or you? As if they've had matrix before, if they've had I'm linear getting, equations, yeah. solving sets I'm of linear equations. I'm getting feedback, too. What is that? I don't know. Is that me or you? If they've had matrix before, okay, if they've it's not that. It's linear it's equations. I'm getting feedback, my apps that aren't this. There we go. Oh, my goodness. So many things open here. Let me pop this out again. I got. I fixed it. See, we're, this is, I told her she's my guinea pig, so. Okay. Yeah. I'm a professional guinea pig. Yeah, we, you do that for a living, don't you? I do. That's what, re, that's what a researcher is. I'm a professional guinea pig. I just operate on myself. Uh, oh, shoot. Did I just do that? I just did, didn't I? Uh, all right, well, I'm figuring this out so people can leave the, read the live chat in real time. Uh, you want to? Maybe explain a little bit about uh, the, the Galos theory and matrix and what we're going to be doing. So basically, most people that are watching this, um, you have seen solving linear systems before, right? And, and we'll keep it simple and just do two variables, right? You have two variables, two equations that relate them, and we'd really like to know um, what X and Y are, essentially. So we're used to this, and we're even used to doing it in a matrix form. But and we're going to essentially go through that just as a, a brief review. And then I'm going to break the rules. I am going to break arithmetic. Uh, break meaning we aren't going to live in the reals anymore, and certain things that you took for granted as equivalents will be shown to be just a special case of nice things. So what happens when I take away 
certain things that you're used to having, like say negative numbers or fractions. What if you don't have those anymore? How do you solve a linear system in that space? And well, I mean, there, there are reasons for this, right? This isn't just me screwing around with your head. Um, although, you know, I'll admit that we do kind of do that as mathematicians. Hey, what happens if we take away this? Um, that is kind of the essence of actually how a lot of really, really good mathematics is discovered. How much is truly necessary, right? If I take away some property, what am I left with? What's still true and what do I lose? And that's how you get from arithmetic to what's called abstract algebra or modern algebra. Uh, some people call it modern algebra, although it's old enough that I don't think we can call it modern anymore, but abstract algebra. And why do we care about abstract algebra? Because then we can actually, things that would otherwise be extremely complicated to compute, say symmetries of molecules, can actually be shown to be equivalent to simple permutation groups, which means now my operations are way simpler and I can figure out if two molecules are, say, isomers or not. Whereas otherwise it would have been hugely expensive simulations and a whole bunch of like, well, if I twist it this way, is it really the same? So we can simplify a lot of stuff by going abstract, which is one of those things that, that seems counterintuitive until you actually see it in action. And I would recommend to people, hold tight before you pass judgment. Um, I know people are kind of math phobias, phobics a little bit, but this is interesting. This is good stuff. Trust me. You're going to like this. Um, don't the, run away. Yeah, don't run away. The, the, the three people that voted down um, the Geek Room will find you because they have tools and they know people, and they will find you. So, um, yeah, we got three, we, had, we had two down votes before we went on air. That tells you how much some people dislike math. Um, I don't get it. But anyways, stick with this. You guys will like this. I've already seen most of the presentation. If I can understand it, anybody can understand it, except the Geek Room, but they're only going to be modding anyway. So I'm kidding, Frank. I'm kidding. He's a smart right. guy. So I guess, I guess I'll dive right in. Cause dive I'm, it. You know, dive in. I'm weird. All right. So let's just get started. And we've seen linear systems before. So just as a review, so for those of you that have seen it before, bear with me. For those of you that haven't, I'm going to go through it. Um, so we have two unknown variables, x and y. And we have two equations that relate them. So in our case, we're going to have, we know that 2x plus y gives us 3. And we know that x plus 2y gives us 3. And I want to know all the possible pairs of x and y that satisfy these two equations simultaneously. So there's a few interesting facts about linear systems. Um, well, we have two equations and two unknowns. That means that at least one unique solution is possible. So in particular, when you're dealing with linear systems, a linear system either has zero solutions, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. There are no other options. So you can't have two and only two. It's one, infinitely many, or zero. And like I said, this isn't a linear algebra course, um, but I'm happy to explain why, why that's the case. So in this case, if we have two equations and two unknowns, it is possible to have one unique solution. And in this case, it does because I'm not mean. I'm not going to give you one that has infinitely many solutions. Um, if we had two unknowns and one equation, then there would be infinitely many solutions. So it, right, you have to match them up, two equations to two unknowns or n equations to n unknowns. And that's the only way it's possible to have one unique solution. Doesn't guarantee it, but it's possible. In this case, like I said, I'm not going to be mean and hand you one that, like, just kidding, no solutions. It, well, it would, um, it would be pretty easy to make one that had no solutions, right? <laughs> right. You and, and, you know, but that's not the point here. The point is to play with a little bit of arithmetic and then break some rules because, honestly, for all the kind of junk that mathematicians get about being rigorous and kind of um, stodgy almost, what we really do for a living is break rules. Okay. So... Basically, as a slight refresher, substitution is the, is the method that most people learn in high school. That's the first one. So the first thing that we'll do is simply move everything, basically solve that top equation for y. So I just moved it over. So y is equal to 3 minus 2x, no big deal. And like I said, um, excuse my slides. Apparently, when I move them to the iPad, my pretty LaTeX animations um, go away. So now I look like a, you know, tech illiterate flipping through here. All right, so once we do that, you solve the top equation for y, then you take that. Now y, y, and I get to use my pen, um, except I'm gonna change the color to black. So now, right, I have a thing. Why is this thing now? And now I can stick it down 
in place of y in the second equation. Like I said, for those of you that are engineers or anything like that, bear with me. Um, I know you know this. So throw it in. But now what's really nice is that we don't have two variables anymore. Now we just have one. Yay. Oops. I'm going to turn the pen away and then flip. Oh, that's interesting. OK. It stays. Sorry, I've never actually used this whiteboard function on Zoom. You before. know what? I'm your guinea pig then, too, because uh, I'm really liking this Zoom. i got to tell you, though. I, yeah. I found it to be much more functional than the uh, vMix we're using. So. So now that we've substituted that in that second equation, we have a nice familiar expression to solve for x. We've done this a whole bunch. So now we can basically use our typical algebra to solve for x, right? So multiply this out, you get 6, distribute that 2, you get a minus 4. And all I'm doing in these last steps is simply solving for x. And I get that x equals 1. Great. Uh, now what? Well, you're not totally done because we have to take that. And I'll do it in purple because I just want to play with colors now. Um, and we're going to take that guy right back up and we're going to stick him in for X up in the top equation for Y, right? So now Y is equal to three minus two times one, which gives us one. So our final solution is that, let me see if I can make my handwriting actually nice. So X equals one and Y equals one. So when you solve a linear system, the solution is a pair, right? And X equals one, you're not actually done. We had to go back and plug it in to get our Y. So we have one unique solution here. Notice that there was only one solution. That's the only option. Now you could have done this by inspection too, but like I said, that's not really very, okay, I'm gonna clear <laughs> that's this. That's cheating. We could have figured this out with all this, you know, we, we knew it was one, one looking at it, but that's cheating. Right. So now I'm gonna write the same equation in a different way because we're going to need to move into matrices a little bit. And this is simply a different expression for the same system of equations. This is a matrix form of a linear system. So what I do is I stick the coefficients in a matrix. So the coefficients for the first matrix for X and Y go in the top row, and the coefficients for X and Y for the second equation go in the bottom row. And then our right-hand sides, top one is the first equation, bottom is the second equation. Now, why do we like matrix form? It's just a different representation, but we can deal with much larger systems this way. So uh, for those of you that are engineers or physicists, especially if you're doing things like say stress analysis, you might have matrices and well, I mean, even if you take say, you know, aerospace engineering, they work in six degrees of freedom. There's six variables you have to contend with. So your systems can get much larger and matrix matrices are the way to deal with that. All right. So what I'm going to do is basically show to you that this matrix form is the same as our previous, our previous two equations written out just to kind of review some matrix multiplication. Like I said, bear with me for those of you guys that are uh, mathematically inclined. So if we want to recover our original equations, simply we take the top row. So top row here. Oop, nope, I need the pen. There we go. So we take the top row here and we're going to go with the column here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to match, basically, I can write it here. We're going to match the top row and I'm going to write it like this. And we're basically going to match it and multiply term by term. This is an abusive notation term by term and add them together. That is vector multiplication. And that's going to give us one scalar or, numer or you know, number effectively. So we have two times x plus one times y. So this row times this column gives us this object 2x plus y. And that's equal to our first object up here. So now we've recovered our first equation. And if I do the exact same thing, uh, stop it. If I do the exact same thing, second row, back to the pen. So, so you might, so, so the people that never had matrix, um, cause I'm watching the live chat, they're probably going nuts right here. Um, you want to maybe explain how you're converting like a row, you're taking the column, you're multiplying the row by the column to get the okay. new ma matrix by, get, you're converting it to a one by one. Yes. Okay. So basically what we have, if we are going to multiply it, I'll, I'll do it out by hand. So let's extract the second row one, two, we have the column X, Y. You can only, this is a one row by two column matrix or vector. And this is a two row by one column vector. Now we know we can multiply them together because the inner dimensions match. And we know that the size of the matrix that will be left to us is the outer dimensions one by one. And that's just a scalar. So when we actually multiply this together, we have to basically do term by term. First guy to this guy. 
then the second guy to this guy, and then we add the results. So that one times X is X, two times Y is two Y, two Y, sorry about my handwriting, and we add the results. That's called, that's, that is matrix multiplication in a nutshell. Um, I actually have a video somewhere where we did some matrix multiplication. I should post that. But there are lots of really good videos on matrix multiplication. So that is brief matrix multiplication, and that is equal to this little guy right here. So we've recovered our both equations. And I'm basically just showing you that this form is equivalent to those two equations we listed in kind of a typical high school form. So there's these represent, it's just two different representations, but we can do a lot more stuff with a matrix representation than we can in the more algebraic form. And, and for the people that uh, may not recognize it, each one of those numbers in this particular case is representing a coefficient. And the reason there's one there yes. is because of the hidden coefficient on any variable that's just not explicitly shown, right? So you, right. okay. Yeah, one times X is X, so if, yeah. Yeah, I'm breaking it down for these people because we have we have like I said a few people that just not too uh, fond of math, but I want to make sure that they uh, kind of enjoy it and ex ex get something out of it. All right. And by the way, just FYI, do you remember? Do you remember how many I told you I believe would be watching this morning? I don't know, fifty. And how many do you think we have? I, I would tell um, you what I was exactly right. Oh, okay. So That's pretty <laughs> it's good. literally fifty. So I, I I know my audience. I know my demographics. All right, so now we want to solve the same linear system, but we've put it in matrix form. There are actually a lot of different options for solving systems. There's not only one way. I'm not going through all of them, but just there are lots of different ways. There's a technique called row reduction. Engineers are probably quite familiar with this one. Um, this one is a little, it's a little more advanced in that the algorithm is just kind of a pain in the butt to explain. But once it's, you know, like riding a bike, once you get it, you get it. We're not going to use that one because it's not really going to serve my purpose. Substitution, that's the one we just did. Except that's super icky if you have more than two variables. Like, holy cow, not, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, substitution is pretty much what gets you used to linear systems and then never use it again. Okay. And a third one, which some people are familiar with and lots are not but it's a really, really convenient one called Kramer's Rule. And that's the one we're gonna focus on because it lets us do a lot of cool stuff and it's just interesting. So if we're going to solve that same system, right? We should get the same answer when we're done, but we're gonna do it a different way. So what we do need to do is calculate the determinant of a matrix. Now, uh, what is the determinant of a matrix? That is one of the most surprisingly heavy questions that a basic high school student or linear algebra student can ask. Um, that's actually like a really non-trivial lecture that's going to be behind that one. So just accept, and I hate, I hate doing this. I really do. I don't like saying just accept. So, sometimes you have to. That it's a number. Um, but like I said, it would take me half a linear algebra course for this to make for the determinant to have like a, a meaning to you. We we um, have we have that all the time in nuke school. They would just they would say, look at um, we're going to explain this to you, but take it for what take it take it as as true now. Then six months from now, you, when you get into more heavier stuff, you'll understand why. I'm going to have to pull that card here. Yeah. It has a meaning. It actually has a geometric meaning, um, but not in the way you're probably thinking of geometry. So essentially what we'll go with is that the determinant is a number that is associated with a matrix. It's like a little property of the matrix. And we'll go with that. It's a number. And we can compute it from the entries of the matrix. So if a general two by two matrix is expressed this way, and when, when, I, when I use these indices, this tells me the row and the column. So A11 is in row one, column one. Now computer scientists like starting with zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Number, you know, shift everything if you want. I those like are, those are just indical indexes, right? I mean, they're just, yeah. yeah so. so we're in row one, column one. That's A11 right here. So A12, still in the first row, but now we've moved to column two. A21, right? Second row, first column. A22, second row, second column. So the determinant of this matrix A, it's either written with this DETA. It's also written with this two bar thing. Uh, in general, don't use that notation because that can either mean absolute value, a norm, a cardinality. It's used too much um, to be <clears throat> it's confusing. Style. 
Now, so you, so on this, you, you just take, you just take the diagonal starting from the top. Yes. You take the diagonal yes. and subtract the other diagonal going the other way. So you go top to bottom, diagonal, and then you subtract bottom to top the other way. Yes. Right? There you go. So we're going to multiply the diagonal from top to bottom. So A11 times A22. And then we're going to multiply going the other way. In this case, since we're on the reels, it doesn't matter. But in, sometimes it actually does matter. And then we're going to go the other way here, A12 times A21. And we subtract those results. And that's given in the equation that's right here. So that's how you compute the determinant. Like I said, right now it just looks like, okay, that's great. We can kind of do whatever calculations we want. Why do I care about this? Bear with me. It has a lot of useful properties and it it's going to allow us to solve the equation, the linear system very simply. So as an explicit example, we'll do it for our matrix, our coefficient matrix A. And we will, I will clear this because I'm learning. All right. So if I want to do this for matrix A, once again, we multiply these two guys and then subtract the product of those two guys. So two times two minus one times one, that's four minus one gives us three. So the determinant of our little coefficient matrix here is three. What does that mean? Well, right now, not really much of anything useful, but it's a property that associates with our matrix A. Now, there can only be one determinant for every matrix, correct? That's right. The determinant is unique. Uh, it yep. doesn't always... Yeah, it can also be zero. Lots of properties come with it. For instance, depending on what this determinant is, we can know if a matrix is what's called invertible or not. So there's, I mean, the determinant is a powerful, powerful thing in both computer science, linear algebra, and all sorts of places. And we'll actually see it's used here. Um, but as far as the definition and what it truly is, as far as the property of the matrix, I hate I hate saying just accept it, but <laughs> it's, it's a property. This is a, this is entry level stuff for people that have never experienced uh, matrix theory before. Some people obviously have in the live chat, but if you haven't, then this is, might be new to them. But at some point in time, um, you know, we do talk about these things. So I, I like to have these kind of conversations. So when we talk about matrix theory, at least somebody goes, oh, I, I know what they're kind of talking about. Now they may not know how to do it, but they under understand the concept of what it is right okay so we know how to calculate a two by two and we're going to need that because we're going to go back to kramer's rule and we're going to solve this linear system again all right so we need to solve for x and y and actually that order matters here so we're solving for x first and then y that order is going to matter and i will show you why all right so if i want to solve for x and this is going to seem out of nowhere. Like, I get that. It's just this really clever trick. It's like, how'd you even discover this? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that right-hand side vector, this little guy right here. And since we're solving for x, he's the first variable. And we're going to focus on that first column. And so since we're solving for x, I'm going to take that right-hand side vector. And I'm going to substitute it for the first column in our coefficient matrix A right here. So now I'm going to call that new matrix A sub X because that's the matrix A belonging to X. So here we have it substituted. So now the column two, one is being replaced with the right-hand side vector three, three. The right-hand column stays the same. All right, we've created that matrix. So we just created this new matrix. Cool. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing for Y, except Y is our second variable. So it means that now a, a sub y, so y's matrix A, means that I replace the second column with that right-hand side. So compare matrix A. So pen. Uh, oh, I get a spotlight. Hold on, what's this? OK, compare matrix A to matrix A sub x to matrix A sub y. So all I've done is make a few replacements in key places okay. to get A sub x and A sub y. All right, so let me see if I can reiterate this for the live chat here. So if you look at the initial matrix on the top there, all the the threes right would be the, what what the actual this, linear equation would 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 solve for. All you're yes. doing is taking that and you're substituting that into where the first row, first column, two one. Yep. And that gives you the AX matrix. Yes. Because you're you're you're, you're taking, you you're going to split these for X and Y. So that's going to give you AX, and then you do the same thing to the second column. And that'll give because you the y, y is your second variable, because right? Second That's variable. why the order right. matters. We're going yes. from top to bottom in the vector. So this order is absolutely crucial here. All right. I, so all I'm doing is gathering some pieces. I'm going to need three pieces to use Kramer's rule. My matrix A, matrix AX, and matrix AY. And now we can put the pen away and then flip. 
Now we have a super easy solution here. I can tell you exactly what X and Y are simply by computing the determinants of all three of those matrices and doing some arithmetic with them. That's it. That's the solution. Um, side note for any computer scientists watching that, I understand that computing the determinant of a matrix like operationally is not the most efficient thing ever and you might want to solve it other ways. I get that, so nobody flame me for that. Um, well, the programmers, they'll usually set the stuff in a, in a dimensionalized array, right? And they'll just, right. yeah, so But when you talk about operations, you know, you want to try to minimize operations. This might not be the most efficient way to program into a computer, so don't flame me for that. It's just, it's a really easy way if you are solving small systems, and it's kind of a cool little trick. Because is this one of those situations where if you got like a computer engineer, uh, a mechanical engineer, a physicist and a mathematician in the room, they're going to have four different ways of doing something? Absolutely. And yeah. in fact, a lot of the <laughs> exactly. ways that I might write for some, that's actually what, um, so the entire branch called numerical analysis, that's taking things like, for instance, take the quadratic formula, how to solve for the roots of a, of a quadratic equation. You know, if you actually take the quadratic formula as you would have learned it in high school, that is the worst way to implement it in a computer. And that has to do with essentially what happens if your roots are massive orders of magnitude apart. If you actually program that into a computer, you actually can end up with some problems. So just because it looks pretty on paper or that we would solve it by hand a certain way does not mean it's good for a computer a certain way. That's why we try to have multiple ways to do things. So back to our thing. Now, I basically, using the determinants of all three of those matrices, I can tell you what X and Y are. So X has an exact solution of, well, oh, come on, give me my pen. It's the determinant of, no, I want my pen. It's the determinant of that AX matrix in the same way we calculated before times the, and then I'm going to use this on purpose, the multiplicative inverse, and here's where we're going to start getting a little abstract, of the number that is the determinant of A. So we'll, we'll touch that, but I'm just giving the formulas now. Y, that same quantity here, times the determinant of its A matrix. That's our exact solution. So why did I put minus one? So those of you who are used to dealing with reals, rationals, that kind of thing. So back up, real numbers. This is where she breaks where math, by the way. This is, this this is, where, is where we're gonna start yeah. breaking some things. So what are real numbers? All the stuff that you're used to, right? We have negatives, we have irrational numbers like pi, we have rational numbers like one half, we have integers like five, we have negative numbers like minus 10, right? All the things you can think of that you're used to when you, when you were taking your high school algebra, we have all those things. We have rationals. Rationals are what happens when you take away the irrationals. So rationals are things that are either integers or rational fractions, or basically essentially one integer divided by another. So one half is a rational number. Pi is not, right? There, pi is not. Um, so all of the irrational numbers go away when I just talk about rationals. We can start restricting our space. So what happens when I start stripping things away? What happens if I strip away fractions? I'm left with integers whole numbers, both positive and negative. What happens if I strip away integers? I'm left with natural numbers, which are your normal counting numbers, one, two, three, et cetera. So basically I'm taking what you know as the number line and I'm taking stuff away. Now, why did I write this as minus one? So for instance, we understand that if you want to divide by something, that's the same as multiplying by one over that thing, right? Yeah, that's true if you're staying in the real numbers. And this is why I'm changing some notation a little bit. This is not an inverse. So remember, determinant is a number. So we're not inverting a matrix, engineers. Um, that's not an inverse. And I purposely did not write the fractional notation on purpose. Why? Because if I take away the rationals and leave you only with integers, fractions don't exist. So there's no concept of one over something. It doesn't exist. So we have to start talking a little bit more generally about what exactly this is. This is the multiplicative inverse of the number that is the determinant of A. So what does that mean? So let's define that. A multiplicative inverse. So it's a number that when multiplied with your original number gives what's called a multiplicative identity. You know this is one, right? One times anything gives you that thing back. That's a multiplicative identity, the thing that doesn't affect your multiplication, one. Now, multiplicative inverse, so of let's take three for example. What's the multiplicative inverse of three? What, when you multiply by three, gives you one back? And assume we're in the reals. I know, but let's see if the live chat knows. 
Okay. Oh, you can't. Can you read the li live chat? I can't read the live okay. chat. It's wait. Well, go ahead. Yeah, there's a delay, so. Okay. So the number that I would multiply by three, assuming we are in our normal fancy real space, to get one back is one third. One third times three gives me one. Three times one third gives me one. That one third is the multiplicative inverse of three. So one other example, what's the multiplicative inverse of one fifth? I'll, I'll tell them. Can I tell them? Yeah, you can tell them. Five. Right. So the multiplicative inverse of one fifth is five. If I multiply five by one fifth, I get one. So also what happens is that we would say that one fifth and five or one third and three are multiplicative inverses of each other, right? Because we get to multiply in whatever order we want to. So we're going to, this is just a new terminology for things you already know how to deal with. But we have to have new terminology because I'm going to want to break things here in a sec. Yeah, and point three repeating is a thing, people. Unless you're unless oh, you're no, finitist, no, no. We we're not going to so not... we're not going to make this into a dumpster fire. This this particular hangout. Oh my god! Yeah, we're not starting that. Yeah, Doctor Trailer's not going to ever forgive me for that after dragging her into that conversation. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I'm I like keeping a semi positive view of humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you're in the you're in the wrong business here coming on into this channel. Let me tell you. Oh goodness. So now that. Now we can, so I did the same thing here. So we already knew, we already computed the determinant of A a few slides ago, and we knew it's three. So the determinant, the multiplicative inverse of the quantity, uh, let's try blue this time just for fun. So the multiplicative inverse of the quantity that is the determinant of A is just one third, just like what we already did. No big deal. Okay, so now I know, therefore, that we can calculate the determinant of the A sub X matrix and the determinant of A sub Y matrix. And here I can do that real quick. So um, let's just do one of them just, just to go back and be sure. Excuse my hand, it's because my iPad is up here. Stop it. Okay, so remember that A sub X was equal to three, three, one, and two, if I recall correctly. X plus, is that right? Um, the first column I know is, but the sec was it, was it one over two or two over one? I don't remember. Well, I don't remember either. So you know what? We'll yeah, just go back and check. So I. You know what? It had to be one, had yep, to be one over was. two. Yeah, because yeah, the first one was two one. Yeah. So. All right. Yep. So let's let's do that. So I'll ca we'll calculate that determinant one more time just to just to just to do it here. Um, so back to here. So remember, to calculate the determinant of this two by two matrix, we multiply these two guys together. So that's six. What the heck? Pencil. And then we subtract the product of multiplying these two guys together, the diagonals, which is three minus three minus three equals three. My, I promise my handwriting really is better on a whiteboard. Okay, so now that we've kind of refreshed that, the determinant of AY is actually going to be the same because literally just kind of flip these columns and then it's a symmetry. Um, it's essentially kind of a diagonal symmetry here. But you can calculate the determinant of our a sub y the same the same way. Um, so we have those two. But now that we have it, we know the determinant of a sub x, the determinant of a sub y, and we know the multiplicative inverse of the determinant of a. And therefore, x is just the multiplicative inverse of the determinant of a, which is one third times the determinant of a sub x, which is three, giving us one, just like we got when we solved by substitution. And why, I swear I fixed this. Why, oh gosh, there we go. Y is equal to multiplicative inverse of determinant of a, which is one third times the determinant of the a sub y matrix, which conveniently is also three, giving us one. So we got the exact same answer as before. You would hope so, right? If you solve it a different way, you better get the same answer. It's the same equations. So we have our answer, which is great. Until I want to start breaking some rules. Now it's time to break some rules. All right. So now we're going to start having a little bit of fun. And this is where we get to start learning what the names of things are that previously may not have been named for you. And first, we need to understand what a field is. So a field is a, a mathematical object. It has a definition. And we'll, I'll go through it, right? I'm, I'm going to go through it 
uh, worry not. So a field is, I create a field by taking a set of stuff. Okay, just a stuff. We can do numbers, we can do matrices, we can do functions, we can do graphs. I can do whatever I want to at this point. It's a set of stuff. And I'm going to give it two operations. We usually denote them plus and, and a dot, so addition and multiplication. But I don't mean addition and multiplication in the sense that, you know, we're used to dealing with the real numbers. I can define these operations however I want to. So we could, we could create, um, you know, for instance, matrix addition and multiplication are not the same as integer addition and multiplication. Um, you can use compositional functions. You can use whatever you want, but I want two operations and a set. And this little triplet of stuff has to follow some properties to be called a field. So first, if I take that set with the, whatever, the operation that we're going to call addition, it must be what's called an abelian group. So in mathematics, the notion of abelian means that you're, you have a property of commutativity. So in other words, if I ask you what two plus three is, you'll tell me five. If I ask you what three plus two is, is that the same thing? Does it give you the same answer? Sure. So that means that say integer addition is commutative, that it doesn't matter what order I add them in, I'm still gonna get the same answer. Not everything fits that way, by the way. That's actually a very special thing. You shouldn't take that for granted. Love on your abelian groups. Um, the other things about a, a group is a smaller um, algebraic structure, and it has to follow a few rules to be called a group. So basically what I'm doing is I'm setting up a definition and it has to be these things and it has to have this huge list of qualifications on its resume before I'm allowed to call it a field and do stuff with it. So that's the first one. It has to be an abelian group. So what this also means, there's a lot of stuff contained in here and I'm trying to figure out like, are we cool on live chat? I'm trying to go in. Yeah, no, they're, they're following. I mean, just just think of commutivity as the order of the, the way you do the binary operator operation right. doesn't matter. Now, there are some other, obviously, things where order does matter. Two times three may not be the same as three times two in certain other areas. That's right. We'll, we'll kind of play with that. Now, a group, that's actually, there's a lot contained. If I say something is an abelian group, that's a pretty heavy statement, right? There's a lot implied in there. Abelian. Yeah, we have commutativity. Group. What does it mean to be a group? What does it mean to be a group? Okay, so a group is a smaller algebraic structure of things. So it's basically a set with one operation and there's a few properties it has to have. So one thing we have to make sure when we're dealing with fields or groups is that if I have two things in my set, so let's say I have, so the first one, I'll, I'll write it here. So the first property of a group, group, is we have to have what's called closure under, I swear, under addition. What does that mean? If I take two elements of my set, let's call them A and B. A. Oh my, okay, so apparently, fun fact, if I touch my finger to the iPad while trying to write, it doesn't write. <laughs> so that's why my handwriting looks so terrible. So if I take two elements of the set F and I want to add them or perform the operation on them, whatever that result is, better stay in my set. So this would be like saying if you know, um, if I add two and three, five better be in my set. If it's not, then my set's not a, that stuff is not a group. You have to, you has to be in, sorry, is a member of that little symbol, that little E looking thing means it's a member of that set. That's what it means to be closed under an operation. We have to have associativity, meaning we can group however we want to. This is really difficult. I will get better at this next time. And to, for, for simplification, when you're talking about groups, every, and I don't want to talk about rings too much, but every, every ring would be a group and every uh, field ha, ha, would be a ring, right? No. no? Well, every ring is a group. Yes, yes, but a field being a group. A field no, 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 but every field would be a ring. Every field would want to be a group. Okay, yes, yes. Okay. I, yes, I buy that. Um, yes. 
because a field is a ring with. Yeah, that's what I, well, that's what I messed up on the other day. So that's why I got the whoever runs math something or other on Twitter corrected me on that, and they were writers about the piatics, and I was like, ah, crap. I said field, and I, and I should have said ring. But that was the difference is between somebody like when when we deal with flat earthers, you correct them, they don't want to go check out to see if they're wrong. I actually checked; I was wrong. It happens. Yeah. You know. <laughs> So associativity means that I can add, I can group however I want to. So I can add B and C first and then add A, or I can add A and B first and then add C, right? If you cannot do that under that operation, no go, you're not a group. We also have to have an identity element. So identity, that means I have to have something, some element in my set that when I add it to any other element in my set, I get it back. So some element E that I can add in any order that gives me my element back. I'm writing E because you're not allowed to use, we're not gonna think about getting attached to zero and one anymore. It's just an element, right? Because I may be looking at matrices, right? So the identity element in a group of matrices is the identity matrix. So it's not necessarily a number anymore. And the last one is an inverse element. So this is kind of what we touched on when we dealt with the multiplicative inverse. There must be an element that we're going to denote minus a. This is not negative one times a. We have to let that go. It's just a notation. There is an element that we will denote minus a that gives me the identity element when added to that. So each element has to have an inverse. Otherwise, we're not a group. So all this stuff here is kind of contained in this first bullet point right here. So it's actually kind of a restrictive condition. All right, moving on. Well, let's let's recap this real quick for people. By the way, um, <laughs> we have a lot of flurfers downloading, uh, just me downvoting this video. They don't realize that even a downvote counts as a view. Thank you. Um, so oops. wow, people are really like, how many are downvoting uh, this right now? But it, oh. it, it make down up votes nobody gives a shit about. So, but uh, yeah, it's just funny because um, there's been, there <laughs> we had like a hundred flurfers like come after us the other day. Um, don't worry about it. But anyway, so let's recap this. Um, so the closure if, for people to recap. Uh, cl so if you, if something says you're closed in the reels, if you add two reels, number two reels together, whatever they add to will be an element of the reels, right? Yeah, you better still get a real thing back. Right. Okay. So you don't want to get, uh, you don't want to add like, what happens if you had like two? Well, let's see how many. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a word of this. Um, Due to um, would be an example see. where we're going to be a closure. Let's talk about the natural numbers. Um, that the natural numbers under addition is not a group. Why not? Uh, oh, because you could because you, you if you add two things together. Well, no, well, well no, no, wait a minute here. Wait. So let's go through one that is not a group. Yeah. Let's let talk about here. the natural numbers under addition. Is it closed? If I add two natural numbers together, do I get a natural number? Sure, right? If yeah. I, uh, natural numbers are yeah. all of the positive integers. Right. So one plus two would be three. Three would be a whole uh, natural number. Right. Yeah, okay. Associativity under naturals. I can add them. I can group however I want, right? One plus the quantity two plus three is the same as one plus two quantity, then plus three. I get the same answer. Cool. An identity element. What's the identity element of the natural number? Zero. If I add zero to anything, I get the thing back. Mm -hmm. What about the inverse? What's the inverse in the naturals of two? One. Mm. No. Wait. You have to get zero back. Oh, you have to get zero back. Identity. Yeah. So what, do you, what natural number can you add to two to get zero? Nothing, because zero isn't a natural number. Because negative two doesn't exist. Yeah, zero and below don't exist in the natural numbers. Uh, well, right. uh, well, some people include zero in natural numbers, but normally natural numbers is just one and higher, right? But well, but the point but either way, you don't have any that, you don't have any negative numbers to add to it to get to zero. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. The point is that negative numbers don't exist. So all these things that we're used to, the the notion of having an inverse, having closure, all that stuff is actually kind of strong. These are strong conditions. Having the commutativity is actually a really strong condition. So all of these things, that's why it makes the reels so nice and why we operate in them so often, besides the fact that it, well, say, represents reality, is because it keeps all the properties that we really like. And what I'm doing now is I'm taking some of them away. So that's why we went through the naturals. to be like, you know, not everything fits these definitions. This isn't some kind of universal 
you know, pedantic thing. This is actually very, these, these conditions are very difficult to satisfy. So it's particularly the commutativity, right? Like matrix multiplication is not commutative, not necessarily. Um, so we also need to know that my set F is closed under the other multiplication operation here, right? That means that, so we, we've got two operations, addition and multiplication. I better be able to multiply two things together and stay inside the set, just as I better be able to add two things and stay in the set. We've kind of gone through that. The, okay, here's a bit of a loaded statement here. The non-zero elements of the field are an abelian group under multiplication. Now, non-zero here is a loaded term. Zero here is the conventional notation for an identity element for the additive operation. So it doesn't necessarily mean the number zero. It could mean the identity matrix. Okay, but we use zero as kind of a colloquial term for the additive identity. So basically discounting the additive identity in the set, pull that guy out, then the, what's remaining better be, better satisfy the abelian property under this operation. So basically go through the same list that we did with addition, but with multiplication. And we have to have a distributive law. So this is where we get to say like two times three plus five is equal to two times three plus two times five, right? We have to have that. So this is how you relate the two operations. So this is actually a set of very strong conditions. And like I said, this is where it got a little bit heavy, but you know, the point is to actually get a little bit heavy once in a while. There's, there's no royal road to mathematics. Like, you know, there isn't, I'm sorry. It's, there isn't. You're not going to magically be able to watch five YouTube videos and become an expert in mathematics. It, it, you mean, it well, takes... well, YouTube, you mean, are you saying that uh, University of YouTube doesn't make somebody a PhD? It, no, you know, it's, it's boy, like... we're, we're, in, then we're screwed. That's how everybody learns. No, no, look, at, I, I happen to like watching YouTube videos. I'm not going to disparage them because I learn no. a lot from them, but I happen to agree wholeheartedly. If you have no formal education, you're, it's going to be very difficult, even if you're autodidactic to learn a lot of things that we talk about. It, it's, just, it's just very difficult stuff to, to learn. There's, there's no video. royal road. I mean, honestly, to, to be honest, the stuff that I just gave you, I didn't have until a late undergraduate, right? I didn't see this. I didn't see any of these notions until two years before I got my bachelor's degree. So this, this is not, this is not considered trivial. You know, it, it takes time. It's okay. And honestly, what's cool about YouTube videos is you can go back and rewatch it and kind of, you have to do the work on your own, right? If yeah. you want to understand it, you got to put forth some effort. I like, you know, I can't dance around and all of a sudden you just absorb it, you know, by osmosis. It, it takes thought as all good things worth doing take thought. Do, do you know what I do is I usually go to like Google Books, right? And I will find something and I'll be reading about it and I'll be reading. And if I come across something on a concept that I'm not quite grasping, that is when I go to YouTube videos and see maybe somebody has explained it in a different way yeah. where I can understand it better. That's how I particularly learn a lot of stuff. Now, I'll say, like, my little aside here is um, Wikipedia math articles are wonderful for mathematicians. Yeah, they're um, they're a bit much. I think they're I think they're not explained very well, even though, I mean, obviously, I think they clearly are correct kind of stuff. I mean, yes, but, they are good, yeah. but sometimes, like, wow, that was not helpful. I didn't need to. You almost have too much information. Yeah, that's, I, I, I can't learn anything from Wiki learning math. It's just that is for people that have already known this stuff and it's more of a... Uh, uh, a repository of quick things with math for math stuff where you want to know, I don't know, the details of something, but it's not going to explain it right. to you. It, it doesn't, or if you we, have the, you know. yeah, or if you have the background and like, well, I can look something up because if they start referring to a whole bunch of other terms, I don't have to go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole because like, well, I know what a cyclic group is or whatever. You know, we don't have to go down this rabbit hole when you've forgotten what you originally looked up. Right. That's me. Okay. So, the stuff we kind of just covered, it's okay to sort of let this go. This is me being really, really rigorous and saying, this is the, what we're working with. This isn't me just making a bunch of stuff up. So it's okay if you want to, oops, you want to skip this. All right. So now that we've kind of defined a field, what I'm going to do is now we're going to change our world. I am going to strip everything from your world except the entities. I am no longer going to use the term number. The entities, zero, one, two, and three. They no longer, nothing else in your world exists. You don't know what five is. You don't know what pi is. You don't know what negative 10 is. They don't exist. It's not a thing. 
So GF stands for a Galois field, and it's also known as a finite field. The four is because we have four elements. Fun fact, um, Galois was a genius mathematician who died in a duel at like age 20 or 21. Um, yeah. So he actually had created all of this before he was 20 and died in a duel. And these are finite fields. And this actually became the precursor to what's now known as abstract or modern algebra. And in, in Galois field theory, which is kind of a subset of algebra, it's a bit more restrictive. Not all finite fields exist. So for instance, the only Galois fields that exist are either those with a prime number of elements or those with a prime power of elements. So four is two squared, two is prime. That's a power of a prime. So GF4 exists. GF6 does not. GF6, there is no GF6. There's no finite field with only six elements in it. Not that satisfies the definition of a field because the prime decomposition of six is two times three. There is no, six is not prime, obviously. And there is no prime that when you raise it to some power gives you six. So GF6 actually does not exist. GF16 exists. GF27 exists right? But not any number. So any cardinality that is not a prime or a power of a prime. So those are my little fun facts here. So what the Galois field is doing is I'm going to restrict your world to, in this case, four elements. That means when we talk about addition and multiplication, because we want our two operations for a field, I only have these operations, right? Because that's why I went over closure. That means I can't add two things and get something outside my field. That doesn't exist. So now we start playing with these addition and multiplication tables. So how to use it? Well, they are abelian, so it doesn't matter what order you add them in, but zero. So zero plus zero gives us zero. Makes sense. Zero plus one gives us one. Zero plus two gives us two. Zero plus three gives us three. If I add in the other order, one plus zero gives us one. 2 plus 0 gives us 2. 3 plus 0 gives us 3. This really nice symmetry here is what tells us it's an abelian group because we don't always have that property. Now, here's where things get a little interesting. What is... So, well, cool. 1 plus 2 equals 3. That looks familiar, right? 1 plus 3. So, 1 plus 3 is now 2. So, here's where last time I think I tried to present this to people, they got mad at me. 1 plus 3 is 4. Yes, it is in the reals. So this is where we have to learn to let go of one and three representing quantities of things. So one pi plus three pies, and now I have four plies, right? If I, if I have a pie and you bring three pies to my house, I now have four pies. When the one and the three are basically representative of a quantity of physical objects. Not here. These are just symbols. They're just entities. That's all they are. We're, we're defining an entirely new system of arithmetic on abstract entities. And because we have to be closed, Right? We have to be completely closed, which means if I add 1 and 3, I have to get something that's in 0, 1, 2, or 3. So I can't get 4. 4 doesn't exist. We don't know what 4 is. So because 1 plus 2 is 3, the only thing left for this to be possible is 2, because we have to stay in the field. So we can do the same thing here, right? Uh, 2 plus 1 gives us 3. 2 plus 2 now gives us 0. And 2 plus 3 gives us 1. Now, why does it happen, right? Why... Are these randomly assigned? Where did I come up with all this crap? Um, as it turns out, you can you generate these fields through polynomial rings. Um, and this is where it got a little heavy, so I didn't touch on it here. I'm basically giving you the multiplication and addition tables, but these are not just made up from scratch. These are actually generated from fields of polynomials. They're generated from polynomials, and you basically mod out by a certain what's called an irreducible polynomial. It gets heavy. Um, so Galois really was quite a quite an intellect. And these are the results when we attach what are called numbers to them. So I've broken arithmetic now, so it doesn't look the same. Oh, also for you guys that are also a little mathematically inclined, you want this to be mod four, don't you? But one plus three isn't zero; it's two. She chastised not, me on that already because I said it's not, mod four. Yeah. She's like Steve, that's no, not, bad Steve. That's not mod four, and I'll tell you why it's not mod four. Fun fact also about Galois fields. If the Galois field has a prime number of elements, addition is mod that prime. If it's not a prime number of elements, then it is not. The addition is not mod that number. So GF2 
edition is mod two. GF three edition is mod three. GF nine edition is not mod nine. So fun fact about that. That also has to do with how they're generated. Um, there's fun little things to do about that. Okay, now we get to move to multiplication. A few familiar things. Zero times anything gives us zero. Yay. One times anything gives us the thing back. Yay. And now we have that two times two gives us three. Why? Four doesn't exist. And two times three gives us one. Now, because, right, you have to get a unique element back. This is kind of where the Sudoku style comes in. If two times two gives us three, then we've used up zero, two, and three, and we have to get one in this column. You can't have two. It's like Sudoku, right? You can't have a two in the same row or column. Can't have two of the same element. So this is our addition and multiplication table. So now we start kind of going back through and what are some, you know, what are some of the, the things that we might need? What's the additive identity? What is the thing that when you add stuff to it gives you the thing back? So if I add zero to anything, I get the thing back. One plus zero is one, two plus zero is two, zero plus three is three. Zero is my additive identity. Zero is the thing that does nothing when I add stuff to it. Next, whoop, gotta turn the pen off. What's the multiplicative identity? This is the same idea, except what times stuff doesn't do anything? Not zero, because if that zeroes everything out, right? If I multiply zero by anything, I get zero. That doesn't give me the thing back. So the multiplicative identity in this case is our entity one. Now we get to have a little bit more fun. What's the additive inverse of each element? So the additive inverse is what is the thing for each one, right? The additive inverse is something that's element specific. So let's look at one. Whoop, let's look at one with a pen. What's the thing that when you add to it, you get zero? Well, here's zero in the row of one. What's the thing I added to get that? One. So the additive inverse of one is itself. So one plus one equals zero and you broke math. Uh, not necessarily. You guys have done binary. Yeah. Two. What's the additive inverse of two? What's the thing when you add to two gives you zero? Zero. Two. Right? We want to add the thing to two to get zero. We want to, the result wants to be the additive identity. So we add two to two and then get the additive identity of zero. So zero is our additive identity. But when I find the additive inverse, I want to find the thing that gives me the additive identity. So two is its own additive inverse. Three, what's its additive inverse? Well, I want to get zero. So what do I add? Three. I add three. So actually, this is a fairly interestingly unique thing in that every element here is its own additive inverse. So what we would look at in conventional notation, because subtraction doesn't really exist here. Subtraction actually doesn't exist at all. Subtraction is simply what we know as adding the additive inverse. And adding the additive inverse in the reals is the same as multiplying a minus one by the number and then adding those two, right? So two minus two is two plus a negative two. But, but negative this, two being its additive inverse. But correct me if I'm wrong, this, this shouldn't be thought of as similar to different bases, right? Because even in binary, you have one plus one equals zero. That's no. a different base. This is a different, this is a different field altogether. This so is a different it, field altogether. Now, so it, the thing about binary that's coincidental is that you actually use GF2, which is binary to generate GF4, which is why you kind of see this guy that looks like binary right here, binary edition. Um, that's because I actually use binary, the binary field to generate GF4. But, 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 but GF2, it's still, it, even though it's GF2, it, that's not like it, synonymous with a change of base though, is it? No, no, it okay. is not. We are okay. in a different world. All right, that's that's uh, that's what I kind of want to make clear to the live chat because, um, you know, we were talking about base changing the other day, me and somebody else in the live chat, and I just want to make sure that everybody no. in the live chat so, realizes that ba changing a base does is not the same thing as what she's doing right now. That's correct. So when you change a base, like say going from base ten to base e, for example, you're still operating in reals, just with a different decimal system. We're we're not. Yeah, this is th that's a good point to bring up. This is not the same as changing a basis because even if I change from base 10 to base something else, all those numbers still exist. They just look different. All those numbers that you had before still exist. They look different. Here, I've, I've stripped a bunch of stuff away from you and I've changed the operations. So we're, we're not even in the same world there anymore. But that's a good point to bring up. I've actually never had anyone mention that or 
it, it, it was just it. it was just something we had talked about the other day with a few people in the live chat and uh, I was because because somebody had actually asked me a question to explain to somebody else that just by changing a base you're still in the reels you're still talking about certain numbers just but you just a different way of, of representing using a symbol or a numeral yes. or whatever it is whatever value you have on that real number line it's just a different mathematical uh, way of, of, of expressing it that's it it's just a symbol that's all these things are symbols but this right here is completely different it's not even in the reels it's in a completely different field altogether and that's right. why i wanted it's to not to just yeah they're not reels up. they're not naturals yeah this isn't a new representation of the same numbers. right exactly these are, this is a totally different space and we, we can do that. We can change spaces all we want to. And it actually, there's a lot of reasons why we might do that. But this is just to show you that you can. Right. All right. Oh, now we can do the same exercise. What is the multiplicative inverse of each element? So now for that, we get to scoot over here to this table. This is our multiplication table. What is the multiplicative inverse of each element? So remember, the multiplicative identity is not zero. It is one. One is the multiplicative identity. So what thing can I multiply by one to get one back? Well, there's one, right? We get to move up the column. Yay, one is its own multiplicative inverse. What about two? Now we're at two. I want to get one as a result. So what do I multiply by two to get one? Three. Two times three gives me one. Three times two also gives me one. So two and three are multiplicative inverses of each other, which is kind of makes sense because that's all that's left. Now, zero, zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. Yikes, did I break my rules? No, I said that the non-zero elements under multiplication had to form a group. So it's okay that zeros, zeros everything out. That's why we're particular about definitions, by the way, because otherwise I would have ended up in a lot of trouble. So it's okay that we have these row and columns of zeros. I didn't break anything. I'm still consistent. So why do we kind of do this? It's one to get used to terminology for stuff that you already know. But if we use more abstract terminology, that's when we're allowed to change rules. We don't have to keep the same rules anymore if we talk about additive identities instead of the number zero. Now we can, we don't, we're, not, we're not limited anymore. Now I can go wherever I want to. So now that we have these, what if we solve the same system, but under the rules of GF4? So the procedure, the actual calculations are the same, but what those calculations will turn out to be are not. So we're going to use the same rule, right? We haven't changed the algorithm at all. I'm just changing your number system and your addition and multiplication. So our pieces that we still need for Kramer's rule Still our matrix A, which is our coefficient matrix. I've changed nothing, right? I've, I, lit, there's still twos, there's still ones, there's still threes. It's just I've changed your rules of arithmetic a little bit. So I, A is what we needed, and we needed our A sub X and A sub Y. Nothing has changed there. I'm not changing anything. But now, if I want to go compute all those quantities, which is what I need to solve the system, we're gonna have to compute those all over again because our rules aren't the same anymore. So if I want to look at the determinant of A, remember that A was yeah, pen, uh, two, one, one, two, right? So if I want to compute the determinant of A, so once again, multiply these two, subtract the product of those two, that's still two times two minus, and we'll talk about that in a sec, one times one. Okay, well, now we have to go look at our multiplication table because this is the world we live in now. So what is two times two now? Not four, four doesn't exist. So according to our multiplication table, it's three. One times one is still one, yay. Okay, now we have to move to what it means to say A minus B. I left it there just so we didn't change things up. A minus B is A plus the additive inverse, which this is a notation for the additive inverse of B, not negative B. It is a coincidence that the additive inverse of a real number is negative one times that number. That is a coincidence and a special case. You don't get that all the time. That's just a notation now. So minus does not mean minus one. So the additive inverse, so we have to do, so A is three, so three minus one. So we need to find what this thing means. It says we need to figure out what the additive inverse of one is and add it to three. That's what this is telling us to do. 
Well, the additive inverse of one is one. We determined that last in just a, just a second ago. So we add the additive inverse of one. So three plus one. Well, in three plus one, we go back to this table over here. Three plus one gives us two. So in this world, three minus one equals three plus one, which gives us two, which seems completely nonsensical and might start a Twitter war until you sit there and realize that these aren't real numbers. This does make sense. Actually, it's a total coincidence, by the way, that three minus one gave you two, right? If you notice this little thing here, total coincidence, please don't assume that always happens. That's probably a bad example on my part. I shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Um, in this space, I'm not just messing with you. I'm following the actual definition of what it means when we say subtraction. Subtraction is just a convenient notation for adding the additive inverse. All of those, all of those things that you're used to, all of those equivalents, like dividing by a number is the same as multiplying by one over that number, only works in reals or rationals. Subtracting something as being the same as adding the negative of something only works in reals, integers, and rationals. That's not always the case. The, those equivalences that they teach you in elementary school, to me, are almost kind of limiting because it makes it hard for you to let go of what it really means when we say an additive inverse or when we say subtracting. You know, how would I fix that? I don't, I don't debate education, so nobody, nobody DM me on Twitter and ask. I don't talk about that um because nobody can talk about that that in a way that's not emotional um but that's why it's so hard to let go and you know i, I should note this is one of the pet peeves i have um and i will talk about education a little bit because my sister's working on her phd in education i've helped grade her papers for her students my daughter's uh, you know involved in, in in school so as a parent um i want to see things taught appropriately and one of the issues I've always had is how they teach multiplication as repeated addition, because I've noticed it has a hard hard time people people have a hard time understanding the, the geometric relationship between squaring and cubing functions, uh, just by thinking of it as as repeating addition. So um, I, I definitely think there's certain times where you know I get the, that we want we want students to have uh, certain concepts like you know the, a subtraction and addition, but I think that and it's going to sound weird, but I think that basic set theory should be taught at a very early age. I mean, so they understand the concept, vice just rote memorization. Well, I mean, honestly, the idea of containment, for example, are you in my box or are you not in my box? That I mean, you can you can bring that to whatever level you want to. So, if I have one, three, and five, and then I have the set one, three, five, and seven, well, is my set one, three, and five contained in the set one, three, five, and seven? Sure it is. It's a proper set. What's well, a proper subset? And now you've basically just explained the idea of containment. Yeah. No big deal. Uh, you know, intersections, unions, same kind of thing. Even symmetric differences. You just, you know, yeah, there are issues with, mathematics getting really weighed down in terminology and definitions. And I, I, those complaints, I'm cool with that. And, and I understand like we can get a little pedantic. Like I, I get it. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not a problem sometimes like we, we need it. We have to be rigorous, but there are times where like, look, we really should just kind of let them call it something as long as you're understanding the concept and we'll get rigorous with you when there's an intuitive understanding then we'll get rigorous. It's important to be rigorous, but if I drown you in definitions and symbols, how are we even going to get to an understanding of the concept? You know, before you can't get to understanding if you don't let them develop like an intuitive sense of something. But like I said, that's, that's my brief. <laughs> so back to this bit. Whoops. Oh, I wanted the pen off. All right. So we have the determinant of A. The determinant of A sub X and A sub Y, we can calculate in the exact same fashion, right? So if we actually can make these computations, three times two minus three times one. So that's one minus a three. Well, minus, remember, minus isn't the same thing as literally subtracting three or adding a negative three because negative three doesn't exist. The additive inverse of three is itself. We determined that earlier. So one minus three is one plus three, which gives us two. These actually come out to be the same. So yay. Yay. Now, 
we also have to find the additive, I'm sorry, the multiplicative inverse of the determinant of A, which was what? Sorry, I forgot my own thing. The determinant of A is two, okay? So actually the determinant of all three matrices came out to be two. Yay, which is a total coincidence. But the multiplicative inverse of two was three, right? Not one half. So when we look, that's why we have this minus one. That's, that's the general notation for a multiplicative inverse. So this quantity, this numbers multiplicative inverse is three. Three times two, well, we already know they're multiplicative inverses, we get one. Actually, so by accident, because Dr. Trailer created a bad, bad example here, we actually got the same answer as we did when we were still living in the reals. Please note that that's a coincidence. That's a total coincidence. That's not always going to happen. Um, cause I've had students do that before. Like, oh, we got the same answer. So basically I can, I'll fall back into the normal rules and it'll just, no, no, no. This is a total coincidence. Um, we, we noticed all those rules changed. We had to go really slowly through all of those computations because the rules changed. We had to look at our multiplication and addition tables because we, there were no negative numbers. There were no fractions. So total coincidence. Uh, bad design. The whole, the, whole, the whole point is to get the idea of the concept of what a, a multiplicative inverse is and an additive identity um, and, and away from just being what we normally would be for the reals, right? Because, I mean, right. obviously, most people would understand what they are for the reals, zero and one, but, but they... You're, it's, uh oh. It's so intuitive to you, it's hard to understand what happens when I when I change it to something else, right? You've got them so closely associated right, in your head that right. zero is an identity that if I move to a different space and say that, well, actually maybe the identity looks like a matrix now, that's hard to let go of because you, you, it's, it's been so ingrained and the, the path, I'm really trying not to make too many comments, but the path of, of mathematical education at the lower levels is so narrow that you're unable to let go when you get to the advanced stuff. It's very, very hard to let go and start thinking abstractly. And I think that's why people hate math. I really do. Because once you're forced to, all of a sudden, we go from nice, easy, well, addition is repeated multiplication. Yeah, but not really. I mean, it is in kind of a physical sense, but not really as far as a mathematical sense. And then when I start throwing, say, pre-calculus or calculus at you, and things get a little abstract, then people go, I can't understand math. I hate, oh, of course not. Because we haven't, we haven't let you play with the notion of abstraction until senior year of high school. And then we throw it at you and expect you to just get it. You know? But this is a good example of, of the difference between people that you know have a basic education, which is you know obviously great, but people out there that think that they're so much more educated than they actually are when they don't know what the higher concept stuff is like. We have we deal with these people a lot, a lot. and nothing wrong with people that don't have formal education. I, I I'm I don't didactic to some degree to myself, and I think people can learn a lot of stuff on their own. But I, I do think it's frustrating when I see people that have never stepped into a college course think, think, thinking that college is easy math is easy thinking you know that oh they, they know all about math yet they've never experienced anything like these things because the only math they've ever experienced is very you know basic what everybody kind of has and, and and then they're, they're, they're the kind of people that tell PhDs that they're wrong you know that's what I mean, bothers me yeah I, I know the tiniest blip of all the mathematics that's out there. There are times when I'm working on a research question or whatever, and I end up somewhere where I might have maybe an undergrad level understanding. Well, guess what I'm doing for the next two months, right? Um, there's so much out there, even in my tiny, tiny corner of the world, well, tiny corner of the world that runs under everything, but it's fine. Um, but there's so much there that I will die not knowing all of mathematics. I accept that it's fine. Um, you, ha you have a, you have to have a specialized. You have to have some kind of specialty of it, right? I mean, I mean, right? Because there is such, it's such a huge amount. But any field is like that. I mean, even in biology, you, you, no one biologist knows everything there is to know about biology. It's just not possible. And that's why you know it, that's that's the reason too why I don't like uh, in research especially everybody gets siloed. I mean, algebraists are not reading probability theory journals. That's a sad thing, because for instance, not it took until about 25 years ago for them to finally reach across the aisle and go, oh, we can apply some algebraic concepts to statistics and explain why certain experimental designs are better than others. And not until it took that long. Mm. Or 
if you want to reach across the aisle from math to engineering, which is in a sense an even bigger reach in some cases, you know, we come in and fill in gaps for you guys made stuff work. You guys made stuff work. And I'm not saying you don't necessarily know why, but you kind of develop a conceptual and intuitive understanding that makes sense. All I'm doing when I work with an engineer is lending rigor to their intuition. Or maybe it's a surprise thing, a surprise explanation, but I come in and fill in the gaps. That's how you went from, we flew airplanes before we understood, well, we still don't understand everything about fluid dynamics. We had to come and fill in those gaps later. And that's how you went from the Wright brothers, you know, little biplane all the way to being able to get a good Lord, like the size of a C5. Does anybody stop and look at that? It's massive. How that thing gets off the Magic. ground. Magic. Gravity doesn't exist. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's pure magic, so, but you know, I you know, I but I have I have that happen to me quite often. Um, I'll have a concept or an idea, or something, but I mean, I'm not well versed in in a lot of things. So, I will run it by somebody. I like you know, like for example, just the other night, even I talked to my friend Dr. Alex Malpass, who's a philosopher. I had the concepts that I was trying to relate down, but he can express it so much more articulately and and, and in a way that it's more more rigorous. But I'm happy at least that I understood the concept, even though I couldn't formulate it very precisely. Word-wise, I'm, I'm okay with just knowing the concept at, at my level. What's been great when I have worked with engineers is that they're, I mean, they know their stuff. They're extremely intelligent. And their perspective is different than mine. So I will approach their problem a little bit differently. I may be able to reach from, like, for instance, I can, I can reach into finance and show you how to apply some of those concepts to network engineering. That's, that's because I live in an abstract world, like what I just showed you, that's my world. But when it comes to actually finding really good problems, engineers are great for that. Like, wow, I did, you guys are still, ha not not to be, I don't want to sound condescending, but, oh, you guys are having trouble with that? I didn't know that was a problem. Great, let's fill in that gap and fix it. Let's fill in the gap and fix it. This computation is being really annoying and it's you're having to do all these estimations because you know, there's a because it's just a really nasty computation. Well, I wonder if I can fix that. I wonder if I can help with that so that you don't have to do all these estimations anymore. But if you if if I don't reach across the aisle and ask them and learn what's going on, then I'm kind of just navel gazing for a living, and that's not what I want to do. So I deal in pure math, but I work with engineers to solve real problems because I don't believe in siloing. I don't, I think that's a horrible idea. Sorry, I was muted there. Uh, uh, let's see if we can kind of continue on here. I, I know we're, uh, yeah. well, we're an hour and 20 minutes in. Um, how many more slides are? This is basically it. So basically okay. all this, all this, um, what looks like abstract me playing around just to see what happened. This isn't just playing in the sand. So the um, Gallo fields in the arithmetic that we talked about one, it formed the basis for modern algebra, um, which is basically all the stuff you know about algebra and arithmetic, but generalized. That's that started the whole field. Um, in particular, what do we use Galois fields for? Coding theory and erasure coding. So if I want to transmit data and I want to create a linear code, I'm actually going to use a Galois field to generate that code, which will then be transmitted over the wires from one computer to another. Erasure coding is basically checking to make sure my information got there okay. You're used to binary codes, right? Typically it's binary codes, but even if I use binary codes, I can use Galois fields of way higher order than two to generate tons of different types of binary codes. It's also used in encryption. A lot of encryption um, and cryptography utilizes Galois arithmetic and Galois fields. So this isn't something that just, now the thing is it actually took probably a hundred years, right? At least a hundred years before this abstract crap was actually found. And it is ubiquitous. If I took this away, all the devices that you're looking at would go away. They wouldn't exist. They couldn't exist. You know, if I took this mathematics away from you, this wouldn't exist. So even though this was abstract and that numbers weren't really numbers anymore, right? They, we had to let go of the number, meaning a quantity of physical objects. They showed up in an absolutely critical physical application. That was kind of, so I live in an abstract world, 
but it's not one that really should be viewed as an ivory tower of navel gazing. They, they really do matter. And sometimes they just take a hundred years before we figure out how to use it. And, that, and that's a key point, though. These things do have practical application. A lot of people will say things like, why why do people learn this kind of advanced math? Because there's practical applications. And I get the same thing in philosophy. People are like, well, philosophy is just navel-gazing. Fuck philosophy. It doesn't do you any good. Uh, what's point per Well, if you're a bioethicist, I'm telling you philosophy is critical to your thing. If you're, if you're um, into efficacy for business, uh, philosophy is a major thing. I mean, philosophy has its practical applications, just like mathematics does. Now, granted, a lot of people won't ever probably need a lot of this stuff but the fact that you can start conceptualizing this start stuff for anybody that's going to take math or engineering i think the ability to conceptualize is something is a skill that you practice it is the idea to to abstract your thought and also to remove like look at constraints and are, are those constraints really necessary are they are they though what happens if i remove them that's pretty much what i do for a living that's math. That's math. You, 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 you see what you can break without actually not breaking it, kind of. Or even if something does break, what do I have left? What can I do with what I have left, even if something's broken? It's almost like it's a reductionism. Know, yeah, it's good to know what's crucial, right? If I want to have the concept of division, okay, what do I actually need to have that concept? How much can I do without it? For example. Well, you would have to have, okay, let me see if I can figure this out. I mean, if you want division, you obviously have to have integers, right? Okay, we'll, we'll, kind of. we'll, we'll stick with that. I mean, the, the concept, again, sometimes when I say the concept of division, I don't necessarily, as an inverse operation of what we would call a multiplication operation. This is, And this is where, I guess, probably people on live chat are going, she is so annoying right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. I no, it. I think they all want you to be her, their math teacher from now on, actually. But that's, you know, she, she's a busy person. I had to, like, beg and plead for her to come in today, so... We'll see when she's I mean, coming next. Actually, in all seriousness, there are concepts. There, the ignored audience are working professionals. You guys have had probably college too. You know, you've had. I have a smart. Men. I have a smart live feed, except for the flurfers watching. They're all triggered right now. And there are concepts that that were never touched. I don't know why. I don't know why. Like for instance, like network engineers have probably never seen much graph theory. Holy cow! Why not? like draw out a network and tell me that's not a mathematical graph right and there's all these things that can go with it there is an ignored market is such a i don't want to use such a clinical term but there's an ignored subset of people that honestly they're smart people so i don't need to talk down to them with the popular math books that are out there i hate those but it's not fair for me to hand you a textbook written at mathematicians on a topic because you don't know what's useful to you and what isn't so that's on me that's my job is is uh, that's part of my reaching across the aisle to listen to you and say okay this stuff might be useful to you what if you thought about it this way that's my job to fill well besides creating new math but that's part of my job that's what makes frankly in my opinion a good mathematician is it's not just doing good research it's okay well how can i make this how is this meaningful to you how is this meaningful to you you know or are there con how Otherwise, I can publish all the math books in the world that I want to. And if no one reads them and it never get, how is it going to get used if I don't make an effort to reach across the aisle and look at people who are professionals just in different fields and say, what are you up to? What's going on? Well, I've been having a problem with X. Like, oh, well, what if you thought about X this way? As it turns out, I think I might have a solution for that. Or a solution was actually created. I think like nobody ever thought about applying this, but this solution is kind of abstract. It was made about 150 years ago, but I think we might be able to use that to fix this problem and make your life easier. Nice. That's that's my job. And part of it is reaching across the aisle and being willing to talk about more abstract concepts in a way so you're at least used to seeing them. And we can start now. You can reach back to me because you know when to ask me, hey, this would be a really good time to consult a mathematician. But how are you going to know that unless you've at least been exposed to some things so that when you see it, you know when to ask for help. I can't expect that. So, yeah, that's, I would like to, to put more of an effort because I think that's ignored. Yeah, and, and also, you, you know, one of the things that you kind of seem to specialize in is finding solutions for people that don't even know what their actual problems is. They, 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 they kind of know what they want to do, but they don't know... Um, they, they, they don't even know how to express you the problem from what you've described. 
And that's, that's honestly where, you know, for those of you that don't see a need in mathematical thought, that's where the ability to abstract a problem comes in. Because instead of getting bogged down in the details, which may not even be the right details to express, you have to be able to back up, look at a very large picture, abstract it away, and say, what is the actual issue here? And then the solution and the things that matter may not have anything to do with what's being asked for. You're asking for X, but what you're really needing is Y. Right. Yeah, but, that's, but, the, that's the same thing in retail, though. I mean, the whole job function that I used to have as a store manager or customer service manager or even an assistant DM was to get the customer what they needed, not so much what they think they wanted, because they're not synonymous sometimes. No, and, and you do it in a respectful way. Like, yes. Look, I'm not saying you don't know what you want, but... Let's let's I, you might be so stuck in the weeds that it's really, really hard to, you, you know, kind of like you have. I want someone else to read my paper before I publish it because I've been so stuck in it. I know what I'm saying, but is that really what I put on paper? I've been so stuck in this. It's the same reason we get someone else to read our writing. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I got some questions in here. I just asked live chat. Um, somebody said they, they did want maybe later on uh, for us to not. Well, I don't know if your availability, but I mean, I, I will maybe do a PowerPoint on Matrix like I did on the Great Debate Community, what I did with like explaining Taylor series and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I kind of have to kind of brush up on it myself, but I don't think that a basic Matrix um, explaining how to do row column substitution and maybe some back substitution wouldn't be that difficult, and I could probably have Bullinator help. So if people do want to see something like that, please let me know. I'm, I, I, I like to do PowerPoints like this as well. Um, if anybody hasn't seen like the one I did on... Um, Polonium halos. I'm pretty proud of that one. Um, I had two PhDs view it, um, and even they thought it was pretty decent. So, I, I'm pretty pretty proud of that for somebody who is you know never finished their degree. Yeah, there are um, you know as far as videos for you know, not to again fairly basic concepts like that. There are a lot of videos out there. Um, Khan Academy tends to be pretty good with those. Khan's great. What, yeah, what I'm trying to kind of do for me and what I focus on is the stuff that Khan Academy ignores, right? This is the more advanced stuff because, honestly, the audience isn't necessarily huge or whatever, but the people that do want to know it really, really can benefit from it. So I focus on, yes, those kinds of basics like matrix algebra and basic computation. There are a lot of resources. I try to focus on that, that point between the super basics and the really advanced stuff the stuff in the middle. Totally. Yeah, it would be a waste of your time to do the basic stuff. I, I, I like the basic stuff because it's good review for me, and plus I have to kind of, um, you know, I have to relearn certain things, but at the, at the same time it demonstrates that I think I know it myself. I, I don't do a lot of the math presentations on the other channel for other people so much as I do myself because I want to see for myself that I understand it decently enough to explain it. That's, that's really what I'm going for. Sure. Yeah. yeah. My, my preferred medium is writing. That's the articles I write. Um, so I've done some on, I like edge cases too, different like edge cases of probability distributions. Um, I, I do, for those that are interested in kind of a deeper discussion of algebra and maybe like a more detailed one that might help, I do have a series of articles that actually goes through exactly what a group is, you know, exactly all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I am fine providing that. Is that on the Mass Citadel? Yeah, underneath articles. Okay, because I have um, the link for the Mass Citadel in the video description. Yes, it, all the articles that we have are posted there. Um, kind of due to lack of funding, um, I haven't been able to really publish much because I got to eat. So, yeah, that sucks. Um, so I actually won't be publishing any new articles until I have sufficient funding or until I figure out what to do. But there are some up there. There's like 30-something articles up there, and then there's nine different research papers that I've published that have been done. Yeah, And you don't you don't have a specific YouTube channel, right, though? No, no, not really. We, I've, okay. I've got a couple of voices. Of, I'm sorry, a couple of videos up that basically are video versions of my research papers, um, just to kind of explain them. But I don't have like a specific YouTube channel. Okay, somebody somebody had asked the question. This is a pretty good question, actually. Um, Zakem asked, "What is it a single advanced mathematical field that you would recommend for physics grad student to study?" Ooh, that's a really good question. That's a hard question. Um, a single one. I mean, physics. I'm not, I, I'm in no qualification to, to, I can just tell you from my experience what's helped me learning physics. Um, uh, I, I, I would, I would basically just say, I, I know it's simplistic, but a deep understanding of calculus. But I, I don't know what you mean other than when. If you want to get advanced more advanced. Mathematical. 
You know what? Abstract algebra does play a very large role in quantum mechanics. So Lie algebras. Um, Lie, oh, Lie, 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 Lie algebra. Those play a large role. Um, that will that will require you know you want to start with like an undergrad abstract algebra and, and you got to build up to it. Um, complex analysis, complex and real analysis. All some of them get into functional too. All of it. Yeah. Physicists, man, we got to work together better. Yeah, we matter of fact, uh, you, you, what you'll find, and, and I don't have much experience with this. I have only a very tertiary understanding but you'll find later on in higher math especially for physics um, engineers especially because engineers are weird they don't like things like imaginary numbers using i they use j and k and and other oh, things I for quantum engineer why that's true though why they use i j i, I, I do remember wait oh, god um i do remember this um i forgot tell me again I, so I, there's a reason i is current yeah, I is for yeah, that's right because I is for amperage, so they didn't want to confuse it with amperage. That's right. Yeah. I did. I remember. So I was that. like, okay, I buy that. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. But when you're when you're de dealing with things like uh, what is it, split octonians and, and quaternary groups and and weird things where you have um, J, K, uh, I, and these things actually correspond, believe it or not, to orbital mechanics, in electron orbital configurations, and you can yeah, actually I... use them to solve sets of, of equations for where orbitals are using these weird types of uh, advanced mass i would say for physicists i mean it is hard to find one particular one it depends a lot on where you're going um if you're in the kind of i guess we'll call it a macro physics so things like orbital mechanics mechanical engineering things like that calculus is super important um differential equations super important including partial differential equations and then I would say to get even further, if you're really wanting to get advanced, go into real and complex analysis. For those that are on the quantum side, you know, really little things, uh, abstract algebra. So the, the type of stuff that we talked about here, gonna actually get really important for you. That's That plays a pretty heavy role, but also differential equations. Pretty much differential equations. All right, I'm gonna settle D on that one. Diffie Q? Diffie Q and partial Diffie Q. Yeah, PDE and ODEs and all that fun stuff. Matter of fact, it was funny, as I, I actually was checking something out on orbital mechanics the other day and I ran across something uh, it was a whole different way of expressing orbital mechanics using uh, and I don't know if it was tensor mathematics um, I'm trying to remember what the hell it was it was it was just way beyond my my league but it was fascinating with the math they were using to describe um, elliptical orbits using this notation and I'm trying to remember the notation if you do you may know off the top of your head me yeah. I'm not a physicist it was it was some kind of vector algebra or something. It was just... What is, and that's really not... That's why I think, phys, like, you know, differential equations get gross fast. Uh, calculus gets gross fast, which is why it's important for engineers, physicists, and mathematicians. We should all work together because sometimes getting really abstract, which is kind of a mathematician specialty, can save you a lot of computation. Oh. It really can. Oh, I gotta tell... I'll say this. Look, at from my personal experience... What what crippled me was my what I when I went through nuke school, um, I didn't I, I had all this stuff in math in, in high school, but I mean I never really applied myself. But there was one subject that I swear to God I wish I would have studied better before I got to nuke school, and that was trig. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's important to engineers. Oh my God! I mean, you granted the, the, the whole concepts of frequency and pi and, and the unit square, easy stuff, no big deal. But when you start getting into differentiation and hyperbolic functions and all the stuff dealing with trigonometric ratios, it is there's confusing of, as shit. And there's a lot of stuff there. So conceptually, it may not be that difficult, but keeping track of everything, you know, I I am not a geometer. Um, so then you can generalize geometry to differential geometry. That is, that is not, I, I'm not a very good geometry thinker. There's different types. That's the other thing too. All yeah, I suck, yeah, I suck at geometry. Different types things of too. thinking. I am more, I am an abstract thinker. I have never been a particularly geometric thinker. That's, that's unique to, that's people who are good at math and think very geometrically tend to become engineers. Yeah, but there are a lot more spatial relationships and, and, and figuring out, oh, look, okay, I know this is congruent to here. I know that the base angles of my isosceles triangle are congruent, so I can do this. I know these were the definition of bi-parallel line. Is this corollary? Yeah. But that's a whole different type of line of thinking that I, I, I knew in high school. I did okay in geometry. But, my God, lately, I, I can't figure out geometric eh, problems Mostly, like, well. stop changing my coordinate system. Just stop. 
I'll just I'm just gonna move to the equivalence class and just stop messing with them. <laughs> well, your equivalence class classes get aligned into real algebra. I mean, real real analysis, right? I mean, understanding well, how equivalence classes it's works, everywhere. right? Yeah. It's everywhere. So the idea of equivalence and equivalence classes is everywhere. All right, we'll take one more, couple more questions, and then we'll definitely let you go. Um, I think Bullinator has a has a question for us, our producer for the uh, non sequitur show. Let's see if you can uh, get it out there, or not. I don't, I don't know what the time delay on this is. I don't. I'm not looking at the live chat. I don't. I don't see the live chat. Well, I can tell you right now, we have we have, we have about 42 people watching. You have 154 downvotes. That's impressive. Ouch. It's flat, it's flat earthers. They get triggered. But it's great because actually it adds to the chances of this video being recommended. And all I do is I put a notation on their triggered flat flurfers. And they, when you put flat, flat earth in a video, it gets thousands of views. So they'll come here just for the fact that I put flat earth in there. But And then they'll actually learn something. So. Ouch. Uh, Bullinator said, can she cover number-based complements and why they work? Uh, not right now. Okay, that'd be another time. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate the interest. I mean, the fact that there is interest is, um, you know, it's it's nice. Uh, my goal is to make this pretty simple. Yes, keep it simple. Less scary. You, you. I promise everyone watching this, you have a better mathematical mind than you give yourself credit for. Unless you're you a flat really earther. Do. Unless you're a flat earther watching this, then just. Forget it. You, yeah, there's no hope for you. Yeah, you you have more potential than you realize. You, whatever the reason is, you know it, it's become kind of a, a fear. Don't let it. You 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 can do more than you realize. And and I've taught I've taught nursing major statistics. I've done all sorts of. You know more than you think you do. You are a, you can learn more than you think you can. It's just a matter of letting go. Let go of the fear let go let's let go let go and just be so, open to it i'm gonna ask you one last question before i end this and i want your honest opinion say what's on your mind don't hold back what do you think of somebody who advocates for the position that probability can have a probability of three what yeah okay that's all you need to that's it yeah that's that's it that's all yeah uh, the, the definite <laughs> face I'm palm not moment yeah uh, if you're don't going down that direction and you're playing with semantics, odds are not probability. That's different. So what I'm is the range for that. what is it, what is always the range of a probability? The probability is, it is defined between zero and one by definition. So definition. And, and, when, and correct me if I'm wrong. When you do a proof by definition, that's a pretty good way to do a proof, right? Well, we've def we've simply defined it that way. This comes from simply the space. Th that space you know, is what we're going to. So when when you're the, here, see this is the problem I have with this particular person too. When you're when you're dealing with a probabilistic space and you're dealing with a probability, that is what it means. Okay, that's so, the definition. Yeah. So we, this is our world. Just like I took away. Just like our world consisted of zero, one, two, and three. So if you're like, well, two times three is six. That makes no sense. We're not in that world right now. Yeah, and I don't mind people creating a new world, but you can't take a term that is used like probability and use it stipulatively for whatever we... Because the reason they think that the probability could be three because they think you have natural probability, then you have supernatural probability. And oh, it's just bizarre. God's yeah, it's just sake. bizarre as shit. And, and this okay. person thinks they're smarter than Einstein. Okay. Yeah, so I just want to get you as a professional PhD in mathematics to face palm when you heard that because that is okay. that is how dumb some people are that they well, actually think these things. It's fine. It's not like my specialty is probability or anything. But a third grader would know this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we we restrict our, our measure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's definition. That's there's no that's that's it's we're, axiomatic is the wrong word, but it we this is the space we live in. We've defined it this way. So there's it doesn't make sense. It's like saying I. That's like know. that's like redefining the reals just to mean you know a, a certain other set. Right. That's a, yeah. that's our definition. Yeah. It is. Exactly. Anyways, I thought I'd get that out there on this video because uh, the person that that is out there who I'm not going to mention their name, please take note of this. Uh, no mathematician will ever take you seriously because you're just wrong, flat out. Not even not even a question of is it debatable. You're just potato. No. Just absolutely potato. So. 
anyways, I'm going to wrap this up. So, uh, Dr. Trail, if you want to like talk about your uh, web page real quick one more time and, and take if us out. You do, yeah, if you do want to, um, themathcitadel.com. So I have articles. I have some of my research up there. Um, small plug. We do have fundable projects up there for those of you that are in that sort of position to make decisions. Uh, we do research in anything from anomaly detection to some stuff in network engineering. We're looking into um, lots of different stuff. Uh, so check out check out those. That's literally how I make my living. Um, so that's kind of the reason until there's sufficient funding, I can't put any more research out. So get an idea of some fundable projects if you like them and you think they might be useful for your company. Hey. So do me a favor. Don't just share this video for me. Share it for her. Get her name recognition out there. Um, we we've we haven't made anybody famous, but everybody who's been on this channel on the non sequitur show has gotten some name recognition. And I don't think Dr. Trailer should be any different. She's she's now twice come on to dedicate her time to helping us learn certain things, and she's she's exceptionally good at it. So you know, share it on Twitter. Get her name recognition out there, um, and maybe somebody that is involved in these projects might have use for her. So. Yeah, so check them out, and um, I'm always interested in hearing from engineers. Tell me, tell me about your stuff. Tell me what you're working on. Seriously, DM me on Twitter. Send an email through the contact page on the site. Tell me what you're working on. You know, I just like to know. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching this. I I, I know this. Was, I knew that going in this it wasn't going to be a, a huge hangout. I figured 50, and that's pretty much what we have the entire time. I, I'm pretty good at my demographics. Um, but you know what? I'd rather have 50 people watching that really want to learn something and enjoy this than even a thousand people just watching for a dumpster fire. And I and I know that sounds weird, but I, I'm i on this channel to promote good science, education, um, and have fun, uh, and to mock flat earthers. But that's just what this channel is for. So, you know, while, while we always have our little fun hangouts and, and dumpster fires, these are the type of ones that mean something to me because... One, a person is taking their time to come out and explain things that I don't think a lot of people would have had exposure to. And two, there's a takeaway from it. So we'll be doing more like this on this particular channel. Um, I will be having, uh, again, maybe some presentations of my own. I was doing them on the other channel, the Great Debate Community channel, which it's still there, but I'm going to keep that there for people that want to do presentations um, and things are, like they don't want to do their own channel or if they just have a small channel and need some kind of a... Um, uh, exposure, right? Because I've had a p people that you know have like 12 subs, and they're like, "Hey, can we use your channel to do this?" Yeah, of course. So that was that's what that channel is going to be open for. But this yeah. one, I think we're going to be doing more uh, hangouts like this and presentations. And I just I just really enjoy this. So I really want to thank you, Dr. Trailer, for coming in and, and talking about this. It meant a lot, and people really the people that watched enjoyed it. So thank you. And like I said, especially if you're engineers, you're just tell me what you're working on. I just want to know. You'd be amazed how inspirational that can be for my work. And and, and we're going to see you on the non sequitur show at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern today. Uh, I think that I think it's what are we doing today, Dave? Is it the abortion debate? I think so. I don't Ooh. know. Yeah, that's going to be a dumpster fire. Whatever. All right, good night guys.